welcome. Today we're going to be talking about experiments in psychology. By now in our research unit, we've talked about the different types of descriptive research and correlational studies and what they do for us in collecting data and explaining relationships. So descriptive research and correlational studies help us to understand the first three goals of psychology, describing, explaining, and predicting. The only way we can modify behavior is through experimentation. So today we're going to use an example experiment to talk about the whole experimental process, the experimental design, and all the associated vocab, and some of the ethical guidelines that we need to adhere to in psychology as well. So we're going to be covering a lot of vocabulary as it relates to experimental design and all of the different pieces of an experiment. We'll talk you through the whole process so that hopefully you can create an experiment of your own. So in order to begin, we should start with a theory. And this theory can be based on some of the descriptive research that we've done or correlational studies that we've seen. For mine, I'm going to ask the question, does caffeine increase heart rate? That is going to be my theory as well. I drink a lot of coffee and I notice that when I do, my heart rate seems faster. But is it the coffee that's causing it or is it something else that could be influencing it as well? So now that we have our hypothesis, we're gonna go ahead and set up the experiment. The first thing we need to have are what are known as operational definitions. And operational definitions are just the very specific instructions or steps that go along with an experiment. This is so that an experiment can be replicated at any point in time in order to prove the validity of the results. So my operational definition for does caffeine increase heart rate would be to specify how much caffeine am I giving my subjects and in what form. So am I having them drink a cup of coffee with 20 milligrams or are they taking a caffeine pill with 30 milligrams of caffeine? We wanna be very specific in the quantity and the way in which they are receiving this and then how are we measuring their heart rate? Are we using a heart rate monitor? Are we, take, are we using a blood pressure machine? What are we going to do in order to measure the results? Once we've done that and we have operationalized our definitions, then we're going to go ahead and talk about who is receiving the caffeine and who are we going to compare that to. Anybody who's receiving the caffeine in this experiment are receiving what's known as the independent variable. The independent variable is what you are manipulating, what you are doing. I like to think of independent variable by its initials, IV, because if we're talking about an experiment involving drugs, we might get drugs through an IV. So IV is what you are being given. So an independent variable is what we are giving our subjects. The dependent variable is then the outcome. In our case, that would be their heart rate. It's what we are measuring, what we are seeing if there is a change in at the end of our experiment. Once we have our independent and dependent variable, we need some subjects to do this experiment on. When we are selecting our subjects for this experiment, we need to be using what's known as a random sample, which is a random sample of the population. We might use a computer program that will select every third student and ask them to participate in our experiment. This means that everybody has an equal opportunity to be selected to be a part of the experiment and therefore, if it is a random sample, we can then apply it to the population afterwards. This is really important. In order for our experiment to be valid, we need to say that it is representative of the population as a whole. Once we have our random sample, then we need to decide who's going to receive the caffeine and who isn't so that we can compare the two groups and see whose heart rate is higher. We need to do this randomly as well. And so this is known as random assignment, which means that everybody who's in the experiment has an equal chance of being given independent variable or being put into the control group. And we can do that by randomly selecting students. We could flip a coin, pick a card, whatever it needs to be in order to make sure that they have a random chance of either ending up in the experimental or the control group. The experimental group is going to get the treatment, in this case, the caffeine, the control group is going to get either nothing or a placebo, a fake or inert substance, so that they believe they're getting the real thing, so that we can compare the two groups afterwards and make sure that the change that we see, that we see an increase in heart rate, 
is actually due to the caffeine that they are receiving. In an experiment like this, we might experience some bias and we need to come up with some ways to avoid that. For example, if people know if they're receiving caffeine or nothing, that might influence their behavior and therefore the outcome of the experiment. So we might use something like a placebo to give the control group a fake or inert substance in order for them to believe that they're really receiving the treatment. This helps to eliminate some of that bias that might exist that is known as participant bias, where the expectations of the subjects might influence the outcome of the experiment because they might change their behavior to fit what they think they should be feeling or experiencing. If we use a placebo, then what we are doing is creating what's known as a single blind study. This is when the participants themselves don't know if they're in the experimental group or the control group. This helps to control for some of that participant bias. We might also run into some bias of the experimenters. If I know who's receiving the caffeine or the placebo, I might change my behavior and how I treat my subjects to make sure that the group that's receiving the caffeine changes their behavior to change their heart rate so that I get the results that I want. So what I really need to do is take myself out of the equation as well. A double blind control is when both the participants and the person running the experiment don't know who's in the experimental and control group, so they can't influence their behavior. I could have another person who doesn't know who received the caffeine or the placebo come in to measure heart rate so that their behavior doesn't in any way affect the outcome of the experiment. And sometimes we actually run into what's known as the placebo effect, which is what happens when someone who receives the placebo believes they actually received the independent variable. And so their behavior changes just due to the expectation that their behavior should have changed. And so we might actually see people's heart rates go up even though they didn't actually get caffeine. Sometimes we see this in studies in medicine where people believe, say, they received a painkiller, and so they actually report decreases in their level of pain, even though they were given a sugar pill or some other fake substance that should not have really had an impact on their pain perception. At the end of the experiment, we need to go ahead and compare the results. And we can do this in a couple of different ways. We could do what's known as a between subject design, which is what we've been describing up to this point. One group gets the independent variable, one group gets a placebo, and we compare the group's heart rates at the end of the experiment. We could also use the same group twice, where we give the same individuals a placebo on one day and give the same group the caffeine on a second day and see if their heart rate goes up on the day that they receive the caffeine. This is referred to as a within group design. So the same group is being used as both the experimental group and the control group. We can also use what's known as an ABA design, where we provide a baseline prior to the experiment and see if the outcome goes back to normal at the end. So with a within group design, we might start by measuring their baseline heart rate, measuring their heart rate after the caffeine, and then measuring their heart rate again after some time has passed to see if their heart rate has gone back down to normal. And we can also use things like counterbalancing, where we change up the order of an experiment to make sure that it's the order of the experiment itself that is influencing the outcome of our experiment. And lastly, we might use group matching, which is where we might control some variables in who ends up in our control group and our experimental group. For example, to make sure that we have similar age ranges in both or similar genders in both. Just to see if there are some specific confounding variables that might exist, we can help to control for those by making sure the groups are as equal as they can possibly be. So here's just another example of what that ABA design would look like. Again, the idea here is we want to start with a baseline prior to treatment, then we give the treatment and we measure their heart rate, and then afterwards we would measure their heart rate again to make sure that they've gone back down to normal. Counterbalancing is where we use two separate groups, so a between subject design, but we switch up the order of events in the experiment. So for example, the first group might be given caffeine first, we measure their heart rate, and the next day 
they don't get caffeine, and we measured their heart rate. The second group will get those treatments in the opposite order, where they have no caffeine and measure their heart rate, and then the next day they're given caffeine and we measure their heart rate. This is to make sure that it's not the order of events of the experiment that are causing the change, that are causing the increase in heart rate, for example. It could be due to nervousness that someone's heart rate goes up as opposed to the caffeine itself. Finally, the last thing we need to take a look at today are the ethics in psychology. What can and can you not do when we're doing experiments predominantly with humans, but also with animals as well? There are four ethical guidelines that we need to follow in the field of psychology. The first one is informed consent. And that means that we need to let people know as much as we possibly can about what they will be doing in the experiment and having them sign off and agree to participating. Part of this includes also letting them know that they have a right to withdraw at any point in time. Early in psychology, before we had these ethical guidelines, people were led to believe that they couldn't withdraw from an experiment and they were forced to go through with whatever they were being asked to do, even if it caused distress to the individual. The second thing is we wanna make sure we debrief them afterwards. So once the experiment is done, we tell them the purpose of the study, what the results were, if there was any deception involved in the experiment where we had to keep information from them, we provide that at a later point in time so that they know what was being studied and what the outcomes were. The third one is making sure that we minimize the risks as much as possible. We wanna make sure that whatever it is we're learning about in the field of psychology is worth whatever inherent risks exist by conducting the experiment. If we're doing an experiment where we're not gonna learn that much from it and there's great personal risk involved, then it's probably not an experiment that we should be doing. And then finally, anonymity and confidentiality. If we are to publish our results, we use code names or fake names to protect the identity of all the participants involved. Now, when it comes to animals, there are some additional guidelines that we also must follow. And again, the idea here is to minimize the risks, but the reward must outweigh the risk. And we have to assume that if it would cause pain to humans, it's going to cause animals pain as well. Obviously in the field of science, we do see animals used for things like drug trials where there may be some risks to the animal. And so the other part that we say is that animals should only be used when necessary. Now, obviously those are some very loose guidelines to follow. Whatever the experiment is, whether it's done on a human or on an animal, they need to be approved by an independent review board or an IRB, typically at a major university or other large organization. It's up to each organization to take a look at a proposal of a study and either accept it or reject it based on the ethical guidelines. So those are the four major ethical guidelines that we need to follow when doing experiments in psychology. And now we have all of the different parts of an experiment so that you can create one on your own. This is the way that we can finally move to modifying human behavior. So if we can find a way to improve people's lives by changing a factor that will influence the way that they think or the way that they act, we can then implement that to actually see some positive benefit in our society. So that's where we'll stop today. Thank you so much for watching and remember, be kind to your mind.